heritage, name, religion, and status. <laughs> I'm Michael Uma, and I'm Michael Uma again. <laughs> so that's real names, stage name. I'm a Christian. Yes. Which status? Single. Yes. Yeah. Um, when we look at Michael Uma, what comes in our heads? We who know Michael Uma. I don't really know what comes to your heads, but I hope what comes to your heads is music and jazz music predominantly because I'm a guitarist and, well, multi instrumentalist, but I use guitar as my primary instrument. Yes. Where did Michael Uma grow from? Where, where did Michael Uma start from? Like Bath, Village, where you grew up? Uh, I was incidentally born in Kampala, but my dad, <laughs> yeah, my dad is Samia, and my mom is Acholi, so they also met in Kampala. So I'm born in Kampala. Um, I, I learned music in church, at home, and in school, in Macquarie College School. Um, I learned traditional instruments, and then I mixed them with Western instruments that I had learned a bit in church, and then started investigating how to merge jazz with traditional instruments and then also um, a bit of classical here and there. Then the rest of it was really picking things, different things along the way, going online, watching videos, picking a few tips from different people that have played before, so yeah. Okay. Uh, which school did Michael Uma go to? Um, I was in a primary school called Joy Primary School. It's currently in Makere. I was in a secondary school called Makere College School, Makere, and I went to university in Makere University. So my entire, Education was on one hill. Uh, yeah, I should say that. Nursery? Na nursery, I was in, uh, what was it called? Christ the King Nursery. That's not Makere. Yes. So you were Kampala born? Very city born. <laughs> so how was my um, childhood, uh, like uh, home, village, neighborhood? How was his life? Um, I can say... I have probably a double personality. I'm both an introvert and an extrovert. I don't even know if that exists, but I have times when I really um, thrive and get energy while I'm alone, like, and I create better and I think better, things like that. Then I also have my time where I feed off um, uh, the extrovert side of me. So growing up, there's a lot of things I would do by myself. Then there's certain things I would do with other people. But the musical part, it was like something that was just calling me the whole time. Because whatever else I would do, I would be attracted to instruments. Sometimes I would play on saucepans and cups on the table, like drums. Then I started playing instruments very early, about six, seven years. Uh, my dad plays guitar. So he, he had a guitar and at times we would snap his strings because we were trying to play, but we didn't really know what we were doing. Then you pick different facets from different places. So yeah, that was me. My childhood was involved with playing, but music, Music was within there all the time. Now, growing up, uh, like um, Kuchalo in the village, uh, being other kids, how was your life? How was my life with other kids? I was—I was, I can't say I was very, very social. Yes, I loved playing with other kids, but there are times when I really loved doing my own thing. You understand? Uh, I liked soccer, and then maybe playing video games with them, but. Not so much, not so much. It was, it was half and half. It's time by myself and then playing with other kids as well, yes. When and how did you enter the music industry? Okay, so I entered the music industry at an event that was organized by Oscar Kihika. Oscar Kihika, yeah, he, he, he's a keyboard player and uh, he had an album and he was doing an event because we, we had Dr. Victor as the headliner and then he was performing as well. We had an hour's set. It was my first ever big show, and I came in as the guitarist. But I just learned how to play solo and lead guitar about, I don't know, like a couple of months before that. Because I was jamming with the different people here and there. Then I'd play keyboard, play drums, play bass, play trumpet, traditional instruments. So I was now concentrating on guitar. And then this show comes up, and it's a big show. So I, I can say I dived in the deep end first. And from there on, I kept playing different gigs, playing different bands here and there. Created a band, etc. Till now. Till now. Um, one would ask: uh, Before joining the music industry or going to school, what did you study? 
like a graduate. <laughs> so um, uh, I'm a, I graduated in BSTAT at Macquarie University, bachelor's degree in statistics. Yes, so the math and accountancy part of me is another side of me, and then there's the music side of me. So mus music was more of something that was an occupation, something that I grew up doing, and then I just kept modifying it back uh, day, day by day. But um, what I studied in school was very different. So I used that for my other businesses, personal stuff, and then there's the musical side as well. Yeah. You growing up, uh, before knowing you being musical, studying that, what did you want to be? What did I want to be? I actually always wanted to do business, personal business. I never ever wanted to be employed in an office. Never ever. So from around P7, I would see there's an advert on TV of some guy, uh, I don't remember what his name was, but there's an advert that has had some guy that was a two-phone tycoon called Kapo, I think, or something like that. He was shining his shoe, he was walking around looking quite successful. So I asked my dad, what does this guy do? He said, those are guys who do business. So my mind changed. I looked, he, looked like, he looked like a successful guy. I looked like he was free, like he was enjoying his life. And I felt like maybe the other side of, of being stuck to a certain kind of life was sort of like um, a ruler life in a way. So I said, you know what, I need to do something that's going to be my own and also flourish business-wise. But then I thought, what else can I do? That's different from what I'm studying. So it was music, how to monetize it, that became something else later. So it's a journey. Yeah. Who and what inspired you to join the making music industry? Hmm. I can say who inspired me to play instruments, for, for starters. Um, first of all, the instruments were at home. There was guitar at home. And my dad uh, had videos of uh, different musicians. And then, so I watched uh, a gospel musician called Ron Kennelly, and he had a bassist called Laborial. He would play the bass with a lot of enthusiasm, joy, like he was giving his all and he was excited and enjoying it. So the way he played inspired me to play instruments, but to play bass first. So I played bass, then went to the different instruments, but uh, that passion and zeal were from watching that video and this guy that was very excited and stuff. Then I realized I had a gifting. And I worked through it up to now. Yes. What was your breakthrough, um, let me say, in kind of a gig? If we could go, go that into details, you've told us a little bit, yes. but what was your breakthrough gig? I didn't necessarily have a breakthrough gig per se, like one gig. But after playing that event that I played, um, I sort of started understanding the industry. And it was like unveiling me in a way for people that were looking for instrumentalists and guitarists at the time because there were not so many. So they're playing with different bands, different musicians, getting inspired by different styles of music. And then we created a band in 2007 with a friend of mine called Chinobe, called Soul Beat Africa. So we created it and we toured about, I think, 17 or 18 countries. Let me say, yeah, about 18 countries in Africa. And then we did Europe as well, and then we did uh, the US as well. So these experiences, every country would go to, I would learn something. There's a time that I would engage with Latin American um, musicians, the guitarists, and I learned from Enco Guitar from them. Then I met some other people playing rock, I learned that from them. Then we met some Chinese playing a traditional instrument. I got some aspects of how to play the Ndingidi from a different angle. So there were different things. So I can't say there was a breakthrough necessarily, but every time I kept playing with different people and playing in different cities and different countries, I kept picking up on different things. So yeah, it's just been a journey all the way. Yeah. Well, like, uh, that's a question I was coming to. I should say something else I forgot. The biggest step I ever made was in 2010 when I did my first concert at the Serena. That, that was the time that I went out of my way. Like, usually I'd been backing up everybody. And then I was like, you know what? Why don't I try to do a jazz album? And then I did one. I was like, you know what, let me even do a concert. Like it was stepping in waters and trying to say, let me do my thing, let me do my thing. So after doing that concert, it was a turning point. You feel like you, you move from being a boy to being a man. I can say probably that was my breakthrough in the career. But I can't say maybe there was one gig that I can remember that was like explosive. Yeah. What happened between you and Chinobe? Um, the, what made you guys uh, part ways? Um, I think 
there's a time when you all have uh, different visions. Although from the start when you're youth, everybody's passionate about everything. You're excited, you're here and there, blah, blah, blah. But I had a career that I had to pursue in the direction, like I told you about, more into jazz and what I'm doing and directing concerts and playing uh, different genres. And he has a direction he had. And there's different members of the band. There's producer Alan that was in the band as well. There's Ambrose, who was the drummer. There's Jude Muguera. There was um, Baka. We had uh, Sewa so Goode Richard. So everybody we reached a certain point and everybody had something they're pursuing that's personal. You understand? So certain units that we're building and bringing us together, when we're not as, um, as intact as we were before. So we pursued different careers. Okay. Yeah. We, how do you, um, uh, which songs have you put in your guitar, if we can mention like five or two ten? Hey. There's so many. I think the song that I first played in while I was still investigating different styles was a song that was Radio and Weasel and Blue 3. That was uh, Where You Are. Where you are. Yes. Oh, yes. That's yeah, that's my guitar. <laughs> so, so then I worked with uh, Juliana. I played some guitar in uh, Bobby Wine's song, in Bebe Cole's song. In Bobby Wine's song, um, the, the most recent was... Uh, the song for COVID, Corona, yeah. the Corona song. Yeah. yeah. And then for Chameleon, there's quite a number. I remember the one that, tipped, uh, that excited him the most was when we were doing Agatako, the collab with, uh, the, with, the, with the, yes. Because he came singing a certain different melody, and I had a different melody I'd played, and then Uncle Pade had a different melody. So he kept playing the different melodies on guitar until we reached a point and we got a certain hook. And when we played that hook, it stuck in so well. Now, it became comical for us. Because when we left the studio, everybody was singing this melody, singing their melody. Anyway, sorry, I went off script. Yeah, so there was that. Then uh, Juliana played many songs in Juliana. I played guitar in many of Juliana's songs as well. I think the latest was in San Yuliange. Then I played in Arina Mawiru's music. I played in Susan Kerenin's songs as well. Sarah Andagire, um, Saha. I played in uh, who's Spice Diana's. I played in who's there's so many, yeah, locally, and then other musicians from outside the country. Yeah, we're coming to the outside. If we say here you've done it, uh, you've played in many. If we go international, do you have artists you've worked with uh, in their songs international? And who are those? Yes, um, maybe the biggest that you'd remember would be Mr. Flavor because we did a song together when we were at Cox Studio. Then there's another lady from um, Mozambique. I, th I forgot her name, but we're doing a project there as well. Then there's uh, musicians that are world music, world, world music um, performers that we would meet in Denmark and Belgium that I worked with, others in the UK, others in the US. So yeah, th there's quite a number of them. Um, if we cut songs have you put in your guitar and you feel, yes, you've done them justice? There's so many. There's so many. I can't, I can't put my finger to one. There's just... May, maybe I can say there's a song that I didn't see coming. Uh, like, I didn't see it exploding that way. When he did Kwasa with uh, David Lutalo. Because we're playing... I played the guitar and the producer and I was playing bass. It was one take. We had different melodies we did and then we played together. There's, there's, where, there's where you put in something in studio, then you go over it, then you take this out and... Then we did one take, we said, let's do it like we're on stage. Let's just enjoy ourselves. And we played. And uh, when you hear the elements, you can hear the live elements and you can hear people enjoying themselves. So I think that was one song that I left studio. And when it blew out, I was like, wow, this was nice. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yes, if, uh, and as well as his uh, song that he, he did an album for, uh, album launched for recently. Um, yeah, yeah, that as well. Guitars there. Yeah, there's so many, as I said, it's a, cut, it's a long catalog I can't break down now. Uh, what challenges have you faced in the movie industry, in the, in the industry? In the, in the industry, that's... Uh, the whole entertainment industry and the music industry, particular. Um, what challenges? We had lots of challenges in the start that were monetary, because you'd work for somebody, now Kuruma. Yeah, until we... We got to a point when it's segmenting what we're, I mean, sorry, professionalizing what we're doing. And uh, you find a way to work around certain things. Then um, technical issues where you've got a guitar, but it's not the best. It's not going to sound good. Then you go to a studio and they don't have like good, um, they don't have good, they don't have a good, um, 
good mixer, they don't have a good um, sound card, maybe the cables are buzzing, etc. So we would have certain issues that are technical. Then of course, um, the, the music industry itself, there's certain events would go because beyond playing in studio, I produce shows. So you go to produce a show, and then what you ask for is different from what's been supplied, and then you still have to make it a grand show, given that. So that in the start we had those issues until you put your foot down and say without this back line, without someone following this technical rider, I'm not going to be able to execute because you expect the best from me. If, if I put out my name there and I, and I stand for quality, if you're not going to give me what I need, I can't give you quality. So if I can't give you the quality, I'd rather not work. Yeah. And then the benefits are uh, everyone will be like achievements because everyone is seeing you like all over. People would respect you to be high. Now what achievements are we looking at? What achievements are we looking at? Uh, well, there's a couple of awards here and there. There's, for, for me, actually, my biggest achievement is, is the fact that I was able, with a few other people, I was able to merge the people that were doing a lot of uptown music, what some people call the Serena kind of music, and the bands that were very uptown, to find middle ground with artists that are either downtown or into pop. Because back in the day, it was either or until we had to find middle ground and for me that was good why instead of watering down what what the classy and um, high quality music is high quality equipment etc instead of watering it down to meet what was probably considered to be very downtown our struggle was to, to bring up the quality of what was downtown to meet the quality uptown because right now if someone has an event or a concert if there's no live band with it they feel like you have shortchanged them. They feel like you have not given them, not given them a good show. You you can't come and do a concert or buy back in the day an album launch and come and sing on CD and finish your event. They're like, when are you performing? You understand? So the fact that people could put that at the forefront, because the time when it was all around, all about CD, 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 and music was losing its quality, and someone would go into studio in the morning, in the evening, they have released an album. I'm sorry, in the evening they released a song without paying attention to what's going on. Now, when, when we brought quality to the execution, for me, I feel like that's a big win. Yeah. What keeps you moving as Michael? <laughs> There's many things that kept me moving that are personal, that I won't delve into on a public forum. But in the public space, speaking about musicality, I have a musical journey that I need to, to, to walk, and I have musical goals that I need to achieve. So for me, each day, I feel like it's a stride in the right direction. And until I get there, I won't stop. Yeah. When you're not on stage, you're not in studio, you're not doing that, usually everyone knows. Yeah. Michael Uma is doing what? Who is Michael Uma off stage or off the scene? Um, there's a few things that I like to do that are not musical. And uh, priority is sports. Sports and gym. Yeah. I like to play soccer. I'm not good at all, but I like to play soccer, basketball, yeah. Or watching them, or watching other people play. Then go to the gym sometimes, maybe walk, maybe. Like, my pastimes are really boring. That are off music, maybe by myself watching movies. Yeah, that's my life. I, I, I hardly go out for the sake of going out. I'm either at a gig or some event of sorts. Otherwise, just to get out of home and go out is, is hardly my thing. And if I did, it's probably going to be for sports, to play soccer, to hang out with people watching soccer or basketball, something like that, yeah. Michael Oma, when you're on stage, yeah. looking at people, there are very many looking at you. What comes in your head first when you've just stepped on stage? I need to make everybody happy. It's impossible. You can't make everybody happy, but it's my mission. So I, if I play something and I feel like it's not catchy, I've got to either change the, the way I'm playing it or maybe the repertoire, or whatever it is. I try to change the angle so that I can see that my audience is excited and happy. Yeah, because I'm an entertainer. At the end of the day, it's entertainment. Yeah. Um, we heard you have a concert this year. Yeah. Is it going to be your second? So this is going to be my third. What I did, what I did, I did back-to-back -back events. Uh, I, I called them seasons back in the day. Season one and season two. My coma season and season two. So this year, I'm going to release... Uh, an album on EP, I'm still deciding how it's going to go. And then a couple of collabs here and there as well. But most importantly, I'm going to do a concert on 6th October at the Serena. It's going to be, we call it the Jazz Affair. It's going to be predominantly jazz. There will be 
a few snippets of different genres uh, intertwined in the in the show, but it's predominantly jazz. It's beyond just Michael Oman's concert. It's a platform for other musicians that are in the alternative arts that are not given the forefront, but uh, but have high quality music. We're going to give them a forefront on a big stage, great lights, great sound, and they're showcasing. So beyond just myself, I'll have other guests as well. It's an annual platform. What? Yeah, an annual platform that will be, sometimes it will be about me, sometimes it will be about other people. So yeah, that's the concert. Okay, what's the need, what will be like, what's the need for you to do the concert this time? Because you are taken long, so what's the need at this time for you to say, let me do a concert? I can't say there's a need per se. This particular time, I, I usually move uh, according to inspiration, and I move according to necessity. There's a time when you feel like there's demand from the audience for you to do something, but as well, I also need to feel like I'm in the right space to do it. Because if I'm not inspired, but I just know someone needs something from me, I could go around and create something, but if there's no inspiration and there's no realism in it, you won't feel the honesty in my creation. I feel I'm in the right space now, inspiration to create, and I also feel inspired to perform at that level now. So I just feel like it's the right time. What should people expect? You know, people raise up expression and be like, Wabaha, Kati Wabaha, yeah, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a concert that is not like the usual. Because what's at the forefront, first of all, is instruments. Uh, the musicality of the different people that are going to perform. Um, it's going to be a musical show of very different angles. I, I can't give off everything, but just know it's going to be a spectacle. Yeah. You always do production for different artists, uh, concerts, or whatever. Who's working on your production this time round. Am I will be on stage still running for that? Um, I have a few people uh, that are working with me, but I have Bushington and, and I'm going to produce I'm also doing the music production myself yeah, and creating the band and so on. We, basically it's something that we're doing on our own with different people coming in to partner with us, but we're, we're, the, we're the fundamental yes, and a friend of ours as well called Roger Rukundo we're, 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 the, we're the core of this. So yes, like you said, I produce shows for other people. Who's going to produce mine? I am part of the production team of mine as well. So I'm, I'm going to give it my best. Uh, he's going to give it his best. And everybody that's on our team is coming in to do their thing. So Do we see artists uh, coming in to perform those you've uh, worked with in their songs? Yeah. Um, I can't give away what's going to happen, but just know there will be a couple of surprises here and there. And it definitely won't be the way you expect it. It's probably going to be something that you know, or a song that you know, and you'll hear it in a whole different other way. You'll be like, what's going on? But I feel like you're making me give away this. <laughs> it's just that people would ask us about the cover sessions that we did in lockdown. Someone would hear a song and know the song, but hear it in a different way. Because sometimes you probably heard something over and over again. So to avoid monotony, we come in and do a production that's different and create something around it. So this, this show has all those different showcases of musicality, production, uh, vocal prowess, instrumental prowess, uh, arrangement, etc. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs>